Hi, Sarah. Hi, Bob. How are you doing? I'm well. Good. Let me introduce you. I'm Robert Wright. This is The Wright Show, available on both streaming video and via audio podcast. You are Sarah Posner, a noted journalist. You're probably in Washington or thereabouts right now. You've written for The Washington Post, New York Times, and other Jones, The Nation, and you're currently a, what, you're a fellow at the Investigative Fund, which is associated with The Nation. Is that right? Uh, it's at the Nation Institute, which is it's actually- The Nation Institute, which in turn is associated with The Nation. Not well, we work with them, but um, they're separate organizations. Right. Yeah. Okay. Uh, well, that's good. How are you liking that? It's good. Uh, there's plenty of investigative journalism to do, that's for sure. That's for sure. And you, I should also say you wrote a book called God's Prophets, right? Yeah. P-R-O-F-I-T, uh, about uh, not just the religious right, but some of the, uh, I don't know, some, some of the possibly less savory you tell me when I'm going too far. Some of the possibly less uh, savory ministers associated with mobilizing parts of the religious right and making a lot of money in the process. And is that too, going too far? Right. But I think it was, uh, no, I don't think it's going too far. And I think it was uh, a, a bit of a foretelling of the Trump era and how Trump would uh, use the religious right. So. Okay. Yeah, that was kind of, I mean, that was the key for him. I mean, when he, when he started out, I, right? I, I mean, when he, when he first showed up on the scene, he wasn't an obvious candidate for the allegiance of devout Christians, right? That's right. Uh, he was not at all. And in fact, many of the big players in the religious right were quite skeptical of his candidacy. But he had a long time uh, friendship with Paula White. Um, a televangelist from the Tampa, Orlando area in Florida. And back in uh, 2007 or so, she was one of the televangelists who had come under the scrutiny of the Senate Finance Committee, led by Chuck Grassley, uh, who was looking into whether televangelists who preached the prosperity gospel and got their followers to give them lots of money uh, were using their tax-exempt status for self-enrichment. So basically having a tax-exempt church, but then all the money coming in is really just going for your plastic surgery or your condo in Trump Tower. And these are things that she was accused of um, using, uh, using her acquired money for. Uh, but Trump had been friends with her for a long time, and she helped introduce him to other figures in the religious right. And now she remains uh, his sort of top you know, spiritual advisor, if you will, a major person in his evangelical advisory council that meets with him quite regularly, um, basically has, uh, you know, the ability to organize meetings and, uh, you know, meet with him in, in the Oval Office and so on. So, so was that the first key step for him, kind of networking with elite evangelical elites, uh, some of whom she introduced him to? Well, I wouldn't say that he networked with evangelical elites. I mean, I would, I would characterize the people that she was able to introduce him to as people who had very large audiences and were uh, like her, uh, people who preached the prosperity gospel and appeared on television a lot. I wouldn't really put them in the same category as evangelical elites, the people who are mm -hmm. typically seen as the gatekeepers uh, to, uh, you know, who's going to be the GOP nominee, um, who's going to decide, you know, which, which Supreme Court candidate we're going to back or something like that, or Supreme Court nominee. I, I, I would say that she was in a sort of operated in a different but related world. Um, and eventually those worlds came together once it became apparent that Trump was going to be the nominee and also once uh, he made the requisite promises, particularly on judicial nominees, mm -hmm. um, that got them on board. I see. Okay. And we are going to talk about uh, Supreme Court shortly, as well as just kind of politics uh, more broadly. But on this subject of, of Trump and religion, it's kind of fascinating. Now, he grew up going to the sermons of Norman Vincent Peale, didn't he, at the Collegiate Marble Collegian in mm -hmm. New York? And, mm -hmm. and where would you place Peale? I mean, he, he, he wasn't exactly a, an e, a prosperity gospel person, and yet, but he had a little of that vibe, right? I mean, it, there was a big emphasis on what Christianity can do for you and how it can turn you into a success. How, how would you 
where would you place Peel in, in the landscape of? Because my mother, my mother was a fan of Norman Vincent Peel. You know, he wrote this super best-selling book called The Power of Positive Thinking. Right. Right. And I think that the, the power of positive thinking helped shape the way the prosperity gospel is today. Like the idea that if you believe in something and you have enough faith, you can, you can basically call it into existence. I mean, there's a, there's a doctrine or an idea in the prosperity gospel. One of the reasons why it's also called the word of faith gospel is that like you can speak they, they believe that you can speak something into existence if you have enough faith and you have that faith on your tongue um and so i would i would sort of place peel in kind of like a continuum of of of, of a bunch of different ideas uh that were prevalent in american religion for quite some time um when the prosperity gospel really came into being as as we know it today um that that peel was kind of in that same space of thinking that you know like the power of positive thinking or believing like if you have enough faith uh good things will come to you god will reward you um with health mm -hmm. and wealth and that sort of thing so uh i would definitely put him in that same in that same kind of historical uh, progression, if you will, to what we see now as the prosperity gospel. Mm -hmm. And uh, I mean, do you think Trump's Christian upbringing has helped him win the allegiance of even? Because you know, he doesn't. It doesn't show. Remember when he was? I guess this was when he was still a candidate. But when when he was speaking at that uh, evangelical college. And he was quoting from Second Corinthians, and he called it two Corinthians because he just said there's Roman numeral two and there's Corinthians. So naturally, you call it two Corinthians. Well, nobody's ever called that two Corinthians. It's Second Corinthians, and and some people in the audience even laughed. There was a little yes. bit of laughter. Yes. Uh, so he's not exactly deeply conversant in the relevant texts, I no. guess. No. Well, so it's interesting. I mean, he had plenty of powerful people making sort of excuses for him. So that was at Liberty University, mm -hmm. um, which is led by Jerry Falwell Jr., who was really one of the first major evangelical figures to endorse Trump. He endorsed him, I think, right before the um, Iowa caucuses. Uh, and that was considered a pretty big deal that he got Falwell's endorsement because at that point, nobody big like that had endorsed him. Everyone, the conventional thinking was the evangelicals were going to go for Ted Cruz, who was the son of a Baptist minister, or Scott Walker, remember that name as somebody who might have gotten the Republican nomination in 2016? Um, and so Trump wasn't really on the radar. Um, but, but I think Falwell played a role in helping him along, and I think also played a role in sort of papering over his lack of biblical literacy I mean, I interviewed Falwell a few times um, in 2016 while the primary was still going on. And he was very, um, you know, very forgiving of, of or, or not even really forgiving. That's not really the right word. He basically would, it said that it didn't really matter because we're not electing a pastor in chief. We're, we're electing a leader and we want somebody who's going to make America great again. So it doesn't really matter um, if he knows a lot about the Bible or not. And so, I mean, that turned out actually to be good enough, I guess. Mm -hmm. So would you guess, I mean, maybe we're segueing to this discussion of the Supreme Court vacancy, but um, would you guess that when Trump was in the process of winning these people over, including Falwell, I mean, they must have had these private conversations. Would you say that the very top item on the list was probably assurances about Roe versus Wade or? Yes. Yeah. Yeah, no doubt. No doubt. And so here we are. Yes. Um, there is this vacancy. This would be the swing vote if there were a vote to overturn or, 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 or significantly roll back Roe versus Wade. Right. And I don't know, is there any way Trump doesn't get his way here when you look at the politics? I mean, he's got, he, he would have to, in order to not get his way, he would have to not just lose two Republican votes, presumably Susan Collins and Lisa Murkowski, but he'd have to also not gain any Democratic votes. And there's the several Democrats who supported the Gorsuch nomination and are under pressure because they're in red states to support Trump on this, right? So mm -hmm. is there hope for, from your point of view and the point of view of? Uh... Uh, I mean, I think that there is an expectation by liberal and progressive advocacy organizations that the Democrats should not just, you know, 
play dead uh, based on doing the, the math that you just did. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, some purely from sort of like a parliamentary maneuvers standpoint, I don't see what the Democrats options are if the reality is that all of the de all of the Republicans are going to end up voting for whoever the nominee is. And even if John McCain isn't present because of his health issues, um, you know, that they still will, you still have Mike Pence to be the tie breaking vote, right. obviously. Um, and then if you had a nominee like Amy Coney Barrett, uh, two Democrat, you know, you pointed out the Democrats who had voted from, to confirm Gorsuch. Well, there are two Democrats who had voted to confirm Barrett to the Seventh Circuit when Trump nominated her a few months ago. So, um, you know, it's hard to think of how the math comes out. On the other hand, you know, I think from the standpoint of um, from uh, the Democrats' base, they're going to have to do more than throw up their hands because I right. think the base is going to be furious uh, if, if they just do, you know, if they just go, well, you know, we don't have the votes and mm -hmm. we killed the filibuster and that's the end of the story. Mm -hmm. and yeah. So that's kind of the position that they're in right now. So I haven't read much about the various uh, candidates. You mentioned one of them, Amy Coney Barrett. She's a, uh, I gather a Catholic, uh, who was um, uh, clerked for uh, one of the Supreme Court, uh, maybe Scalia or something? Scalia. Mm -hmm. um, are there, uh, are, are, is this worth our paying attention to? Or, or basically, is it just kind of clear that he's going to get somebody who's going to oppose Roe and, and be pretty predictable down the line? Or, I mean, are you, are you scouting these people out carefully and kind of developing your personal favorites? Well, I think that Barrett would of all of them make uh, Trump's base the most excited, the base that matters to him in terms of energy for the midterms, energy for 2020. Um, and that's the religious right. I mean, I think that they would get behind the other potential nominees, you know, because they come with the endorsement of the Federalist Society and the Heritage Foundation and so on. But I think that Barrett would excite them in ways that the others wouldn't. The other reason why I think Trump would be um, uh, inclined to nominate Barrett is I think that the optics of him nominating a woman who presumably would be the needed fifth vote to overturn Roe would be kind of irresistible to him. Mm -hmm. I mean, like he could own the libs in, in a way that uh, nominating a man. You want um, a woman? I'll give you a woman. Yeah, exactly. Um, now the interesting thing uh, about Barrett and Catholicism is that Barrett belongs to a, um, a kind of not very well-known um, religious group called People of Praise, which is a charismatic Catholic mm. organization. So when I say charismatic, it means that they believe in the gifts of the spirit like charismatic, um, you know, Pentecostals do. Uh, and um, but, they, but they don't like speak in tongues or anything, right? I mean, what I'm, is not, that? I'm not sure if they do or not. I mean, but that's not even like the relevant uh, yeah. issue here in terms of uh, Barrett's association. It's more about kind of possession by the Holy Spirit or or, or, or being a person, people. Well, I think that I, mean, I think that I think the thing that has um, Barrett's uh, Barrett skeptics, Catholic Barrett skeptics, shall we say, concerned about this is that while Barrett's supporters have used her to say, like, you know, she's kind of like a super Catholic, like she's so, like, such a conservative Catholic that, um, you know, she's like a super Catholic. But I think that for more centrist or liberal Catholics, people of praise is not like Catholicism even. Uh, Lori Goodstein had a, a very good piece about this when, when Barrett was nominated to the Seventh Circuit. She um, that, the New York Times. For right? the New York Times. And she got a lot of pushback about that piece. Conservatives are still talking about the way Goodstein covered people of praise um, in this story. But, you know, they have to sign some sort of co uh, covenant or oath. You know, members of the, of the religious sect have to do that. 
Um, it's very patriarchal. Um, single women are assigned to families where they, you know, work as handmaidens or maidens to like uh, families that have children. Um, it's very sort of insular and uh, not completely insular. They have a website and that sort of thing. Um, but it's not really sort of your, um, you know, the Catholicism that most Americans are familiar with, even, um, you know, conservative Catholicism, because it's kind of like uh, this separate sect that's not, that wouldn't be, that wouldn't really be familiar to even um, regular mass attending Catholics, because it's, it's so different from that mm -hmm. sort of, um, that, that sort of, sort of standard American Catholicism. Uh, you know, this created a bit of a controversy around her Seventh Circuit nomination. You'll remember that she was questioned by Al Franken and Dianne Feinstein about this and that Feinstein said, you know, uh, that famous quote, you know, that the dogma lives loudly inside of you, I think is what she said. I, I miss that. Yes. So I think that what they were trying to get at is whether, you know, whether Barrett would be able to render a judicial decision divorced from these very um, sort of non-negotiable religious beliefs, uh, uh, particularly in light of just how patriarchal uh, uh, People of Praise reportedly is. Um, and I think in a lot of ways it backfired on them. I mean, conservatives seized on it and they still talk about it. And I suspect that that if Barrett is the nominee, that that clip is going to appear over and over again in ads that are run by conservative mm -hmm. groups. Um, but conservatives seized on it as evidence that, you know, uh, Democrats are anti-religion mm -hmm. uh, because uh, they were questioning this, this, you know, God-fearing woman about her religious beliefs. Um, so I think that there's so many pieces of the Barrett package, I think that would be appealing to Trump, um, that he could sort of use that um, to, to, to argue that the, the Democrats are anti-religion, that he has this woman, mm -hmm. mother of seven children, who is going to you know, potentially overturn Roe. I think that that and also the bonus of really, really getting the religious right base excited and probably really excited for the midterms. And, and they would be excited by her mainly because she is such a, an, in some sense, intense Catholic, even if not a mainstream Catholic in yeah. some other sense. I mean, is that the yeah. main appeal? That It's that, but also the fact that she, you know, that she comes out of this, um, you know, federalist society. Yeah. Uh, uh, milieu uh where she you know she clerked for for scalia but also she's you know extremely uh she you know so she kind of comes across as like a very well put together you know career conservative woman who's managed to accomplish all of this with seven children and you know she's kind of like a kind of like a perfect package from their perspective mm -hmm. um you know a a successful working mom who's not really a feminist, right? <laughs> she does sound kind of impressive. I mean, seven kids is a lot of, a lot of kids. Right. I mean, to reconcile that with a, with this this degree of career accomplishment is not trivially easy. I well, think. you know, so the truth is that, you know, she, um, I believe that aside from working for Scalia and she may have, um, you know, clerked at, uh, at mm -hmm. a law firm or been a summer associate at a law firm, but I believe um, that she has spent her career being a law professor. So mm -hmm. I think that people were, um, the questions about her Seventh Circuit nomination had to do with the fact that she'd never tried a case, never argued an appellate case, I believe. Um, and so I think those questions would come up again um, if she were, if Trump were to nominate her to the Supreme Court, because she's only been on the Seventh Circuit oh, for, you know, a few, half a year to a year. I can't remember when she was confirmed. Uh, so, you know, it's, um, it has, you know, there's a lot, a lot of questions. I think uh, there are other um, nominees that he's considering, other, other candidates he's considering who are, you know, have the Federalist Society stamp of approval, I suppose you could say, um, but uh, also have more judicial and legal experience than right. she does. So I think that's something that's could potentially weigh against her. Um, 
you know, because she doesn't really have a very extensive record on the Seventh Circuit just by virtue of the fact that she hasn't been there for very long. It sounds like she's the, she's the if you had to pick one who's the most likely person to be nominated, she is the one. Well, I think from the standpoint of the base will get excited, it's, it, it, you know, she seems like really the only one. Mm-hmm. Because I, I can't imagine that, um, I think that, let me put it this way, I think that the religious right base is already familiar with her name just because of how much conservatives jumped on Feinstein and I see. Franken He's already a hero. during her confirmation hearing. So she's sort of kind of like this religious liberty hero, yeah. which is something that they always look for. I think that, you know, if they were told of another nominee's bona fides on Roe and religious liberty and all of that, they would get behind it. But I think that the sort of level of enthusiasm would be heightened mm-hmm. for her. I mean, there are people who say that maybe it won't be an immediate overturning of Roe that you see, but more in the way of an incremental rolling back. I don't know. Do you have a view on that? That, that, it, that it seems They've to me, already no, incrementally they rolled it, it back. What's that? <laughs> They've already incrementally rolled yeah. it back. Yeah. Um, I think that Trump has been pretty clear that he's perfectly okay with it going back to the States. You know, so you would have, they would overturn it. You would have a... Um, you know, situation where it would be illegal in Texas and legal in New York and California. I mean, I think that that seems like the likeliest um, outcome. And I think that once they start chipping at Roe, um, I think the real danger is, do they start chipping away at Griswold, which was the earlier case upon which but Roe is based, which struck down um, criminalization of sale of contraception. So, um, you know, I think that people who are downplaying the um, possibility that they would completely overturn Roe are really kind of missing the point. I think that they're intent on overturning Roe. And then the question is, like, are they going to go even further than outlawing abortion? I mean, I don't mean to sound alarmist, but like the legal thread upon which Roe is based is, is, you know, comes out of Griswold. And it's not unheard of to hear religious conservatives talking about that, you know, Griswold was not like legally correctly decided and that it's. Well, was um, was Griswold about just contraceptives? mm Mm-hmm. And so you're saying there's, you can imagine a world and see, this would be hard for me to imagine where they try to outlaw contraceptives. Even, tr- I just, there are just too many Trump supporters who would themselves go berserk if they tried to have <laughs> contraceptives, right? Trump well, I doubt, like, I doubt whether states would actually outlaw contraception, right? So, like, yeah. the difference is if they overturned the legal precedent, the Supreme Court, I could see states going ahead and outlawing abortion. I can't really see mm-hmm. it being a really popular thing for state legislators to outlaw contraception. But the point is that this is kind of the, like in terms of the legal theory underpinning these cases, religious conservatives believe that those line of cases were all wrongly decided. Yeah. Um, you know, it seems to me one consequence of overturning Roe. I mean, I know progressives or liberals or whatever who are uh, pro-choice but say that as a matter of law, they think it, Roe was on dubious grounds or whatever, and they would, they would rather, you know, state, get, give it to the state legislatures. But it seems to me that one practical consequence of letting the state legislatures decide it is it's going to deepen the red-blue divide. Because like, if, if, you know, if you've got these red states where abortion is illegal and in general, more and more they have laws that are kind of morally, religiously conservative, and you're like a, high, a liberal high school student deciding where to go to college, you're probably going to be a little more likely by virtue of that kind of climate to go to a blue state where liberal laws prevail and, and blah, 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 right? It seems to me that the more... Just, I, I'm not saying that this one thing is going to be decisive, but the more difference there is between red and blue states in terms of the legal, uh, the legal climate surrounding issues like this, uh, the more blue states are going to be seem has, you know, uh, hospitable to uh, young liberals deciding where to live, and the more red states are going to seem like home to conservatives, and it just is going to, you know. Well, that may be true for people who can afford to make those kinds of choices, right? Mm -hmm. But there are a lot of people who can't. And so 
poor women living in states. Oh where yeah, I'm not, I'm not saying it would be outlawed. Yeah, yeah, no. <laughs> yeah. So I think that yeah, like what you're saying from like a macro point of view is that going to like div- over the long run yeah. divide us more and also sort of create these on you know these very separate enclaves. And um, I think that's um, you know entirely possible. I mean, like you could see people thinking. Um, yeah, I don't want to go live someplace where they've outlawed abortion, but you know, what's really interesting. And I wonder, I I just thought I hadn't thought about this until you started, uh, started down this road was that, you know, when you saw the spate of bathroom bills in the state legislatures, these Mm -hmm. bills that would require transgender people to use the bathroom associated with the gender on their birth certificate, um, you saw a huge backlash from the business community. I mean, even in Texas, where I covered the I covered the attempt to pass a bathroom ball, a bathroom bill in Texas, and it was incredible the range of business uh, businesses and business uh, associations and trade associations and chambers of commerce type groups and all of that how they were pretty much uni- unilaterally opposed to this because they thought that it would create a really bad business climate. People would, you know, uh, these. Um, you know, these organizations that run conventions, yeah, right? Yeah, they're, they're deciding they were, we're going to have their convention. Right, if, and, like, and they right. thought that this would just be terrible for the business climate in Texas. And so you have to also wonder whether there would be that kind of backlash to a uh, potential um, criminalization of abortion if the, if the Supreme Court were to over. over yeah, that's abortion. an interesting question. Um, the, uh, you know, a story that I was surprised didn't get a little more play to begin with, and I'm surprised that it hasn't had any kind of resurgence in the wake of this anticipation of Roe versus Wade becoming a big thing. And I mean, here we're getting a little tabloidy, but you know this story about, is it Elliot Broidy who, uh, Cohen, uh, Michael Cohen, who did the, 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 you know, the payoffs for Donald Trump and paying off, you know, Stormy Stormy Daniels, Daniels and right. so on handled the payoff uh, nominally on behalf of Elliot Broidy to a woman who apparently actually got an abortion, right? And it seems really pretty obvious, if you look closely at this, that the actual father of that child was Donald Trump. I mean, I'm sorry, the overwhelmingly most plausible interpretation of the set of facts, it, it, it makes no sense that somebody somebody decided to sue this guy nobody's ever heard of, Elliot Broidy, right. for, as if he's going to cough up a ton of money to keep this quiet. Why does he care? Nobody's ever heard of him until now. Right. And, and so Michael Cohen is the guy who handles it. He uses the exact same contract he used for Trump, even giving the same pseudonym for the male involved right. that he used for the Trump contracts. Right. It's so much money that you just can't believe it's really Elliot Broidy. And, and it seems quite likely that in that sense, we have a pretty clear case where Trump himself had a child aborted. And, and now I grant that there's some, you know, it's a little speculative, but it's, it's, it's just the most plausible interpretation of the facts, I think. And I, I'm surprised that not more, you know, a couple of liberal writers have tried to make something of this. And I'm, I'm just surprised. I mean, given the stuff like this, this stuff about Anthony Kennedy, uh, you know, this thing involving his son and Trump, that stuff is way more conjectural than just concluding that Trump is the father, was the father of this, uh, would have been the father of this uh, aborted child. Okay. So first of all, I think that the stuff with, uh, you know, uh, Kennedy's son being Trump's lender at Deutsche Bank. Um, I mean, I did not see any evidence in any of the reporting on that, that the fact that he was Trump's lender led to Kennedy's resignation now, right? Right. Um, but I think that that was very, um, that revelation was very um, indicative of Trump and Kennedy, like just being in this kind of rarefied world together where the facts and the ramifications of what Kennedy and Trump are doing with respect to this now empty Supreme Court seat are of like no consequence to them because they're rich white dudes, right? So that's why I thought that that 
that uh, that reporting was really interesting. I mean, like I like I said, we have no evidence that I mean, Trump you know, and the younger Kennedy in particular, just well, no, and the older Kennedy the too, right? Yeah, I mean, yeah. Oh well, they're all yeah. No, they all live in a world removed from the practical implications right, of of the decisions that yeah. Kennedy has made, and also that his predecessor or his successor will make. Um, so, like I. Like, I think that there was sort of a contingent of people who were very dismissive of the reporting on it, like, you know, just saying, oh, it's a, it's a leftist conspiracy theory to suggest that this led to Kennedy resigning or retiring at, at this particular juncture. But to me, it was just more of uh, evidence that, you know, what, what seems important to them is not the same as what seems important to a lot of other yeah, people. Yeah, but overwhelmingly, the way it was discussed, like on Twitter, and I was critical of this. Well, I was critical of a certain version of the conspiracy theorizing. Uh-huh. And, and overwhelmingly, the way it was being discussed was as conspiracy. It was like, it was like why, why did Kennedy resign? Well, he's 82 years old. He seems to have gotten assurances his legacy would be preserved, blah, blah, blah. It's right. not like this huge mystery. And... I didn't. I mean, the, yours is the first take I've heard that presented the the uh, Justin Kennedy stuff in any light other than as some kind of sinister explanation for why Kennedy uh, stepped down from the bench. Well, okay. So, and I stand by that. But I also, I also find it mystifying why Kennedy would step down at this particular moment. I get it that he's eighty two and he wanted to retire, but. <laughs> We're, this country is about to have the, probably one of the most contentious uh, yeah. uh, midterm elections in anybody's recent memory, probably including 82-year-old Anthony Kennedy's <laughs> recent memory, and how he could not think that this would play an enormous role in further um, you know, magnifying all of these divisions, I, I don't know how he could have conceived mm. of that in any other way. And so that was the reason why I questioned the timing. But also, um, I mean, I think that, I, I do think that the, the bit about Justin Kennedy is, is a very interesting data point, not, mm. not like I said, because, um, because, you know, that there was any nudging, you know, yeah, yeah. Or, or any effort by the elder Kennedy to cover up or paste over something that possibly wrong with the Deutsche Bank stuff. The other thing is, I, I will just add this, though, you know, like it's possible that, um, you know, something relating to loans to Trump from Deutsche Bank could reach the Supreme Court. I mean, this could potentially be something that Mueller wants to subpoena. Mm. Um, because, you know, a lot of people have raised questions about like, how did Trump get all these loans from Deutsche Bank when nobody else would lend to him? I mean, all of these questions are significant in terms of, you know, this will eventually reach the... But in that event, we're better off with Kennedy not on the Supreme Court, right? It'll be a less compromised weighing if there's not a justice whose son helped make the loan. I mean, I, I think that, I think the stuff is worth looking into just because apparently this was... You know, Deutsche Bank was kind of uh, playing kind of fast and loose during this period. Trump always plays fast and loose. It's just worth, I'd like to know more about it. Mm -hmm. But, Mm -hmm. um, you know, I worry, in a way it's related to something else I want to discuss with you. I I, I worry when, um, when the, you know, anti-Trump forces do anything that I worry makes Trump's re-election more likely. And, and, and sometimes I, I, I worry that, that seemingly unfounded conspiracy mm-hmm. theorizing is among those things. It's not, it's not the, it's, that's not going to be the biggest uh, tactical mistake they make by a long shot. But I guess I worry about that. But, but just quickly, am I crazy about this Elliot Broidy thing? I mean, okay, so have you looked I, into this? So I haven't beyond you know, reading other people's reporting. I haven't yeah. independently done any reporting on it. But I will say this. I will say this. I think it is obvious about Trump's base that they don't care what he does. Okay. Right. None of this matters. And right. I think that, again, the prosperity gospel televangelist stuff is very instructive. That world teaches you that someone who is, you know, basically, you know, blessed by God, and you know that he's blessed by God because he's really rich and powerful, right? That you don't question them, right? I've interviewed people who are former members of prosperity gospel churches who told me 
that they believed that any negative um, reporting about their pastor was some sort of satanic plot who wouldn't even like read anything in their local newspaper, you know, when the local newspaper looked into whatever scandal was plaguing the televangelist at that point in time, they wouldn't even read it. Like they, you know, like Mm -hmm. they were believing in fake news before Trump made it a big thing. Right. Like Mm -hmm. they just did not, they do not give it any credence at all. And so for evangelicals, even, or, or I guess for, you know, just his religious right base in general, this trade-off that they've made, that he's going to give them the anti-Roe justices, and not just the Supreme Court, but, you know, across the board in, in all the federal courts. Mitch McConnell is helping, you know, quickly confirm all of these people, that this is a worthwhile trade-off for them. Yeah. Regardless so it wouldn't matter. It, I mean, if Trump came matter. out tomorrow and said, yes, this was an abortion, I was, I, I was the, I'm the man who impregnated this woman, she had abor- an abortion, not that that's ever going to happen. But 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 if it became pretty widely known that this was, as I believe it is the case, um, that wouldn't really matter. It wouldn't. Yeah. It wouldn't. I mean, it obviously would matter to other people, right? Yeah. Like, I mean, other voters, it would matter to. But, um, but like, at this point, there is so much, right? Like, ha- is, <laughs> I mean, I guess, like, I wonder, like, is it going to, is it going to, I, I is there anybody out there for whom that is going to cause them to change their mind about Trump? Every, I kind of feel like everybody's views are fairly hardened at this point. You either yeah, like, yeah. And this yeah. is a, uh, I mean, for someone who like me is not a fan of Trump, there, there is an alarming trend here, which is by and large, his approval numbers have gotten better and better and better this year. It's a little erratic, yeah. but if you compare it, I mean, his, uh, his, his disapproval rating is now down to 51. I think that is about as low as it's been. I mean, maybe at some point within the last couple of weeks, it's been that low. But, but by and large, these, these last couple of weeks, his numbers have looked, last few weeks, numbers looked as good as they've looked since May 2017 or something. I mean, if you look at it like, at first, his numbers get worse and worse and worse and worse and worse. And then around December 2017, which I think is when the uh, tax cuts were passed, but, but I think that's far from the only thing at work here. His numbers get basically better and better and better and better. And I think there's more than one thing going on, but uh, I am not heartened by this trend. I think that there are a bunch of things going on. Um, one is, you know, he gets these little bumps uh, either the you know the tax cuts or his you know North Korea meeting, mm-hmm. um, you know who knows what whether he'll get a bump or not from his upcoming meeting with Putin. <laughs> who knows, right? Um, but I think, I mean, my my kind of gut reaction to what's happening right now is that I think that for a lot of people, it's all become like too much, right? And so I think for a lot of people, and you know, this, this is how authoritarianism works. Like it becomes, you flood the zone and it becomes too much for people. And then they kind of be like, okay, well, that's just the way things are now. Right. Mm -hmm. So in a, a lot of ways, I worry that it's not so much that he's popular, um, but that he has made it so that, people feel like there's no point in contesting the things that he's flooded the zone with anymore. I mean, it's no longer news by definition. He's, Mm -hmm. he's done it so many times. It's like, I think right before, I think, you know, uh, just a couple of days shortly before the shooting at this newspaper in Maryland, I think he had used the phrase enemy of the people like a couple of days before Mm -hmm. in reference to in particular liberal cable channels or something. But the point is that I wasn't even aware that he had used it this particular time because he had made a habit of speaking this way. It was just no longer big news. Well, also, you know, so there's that there's Trump's rhetoric that like has become just that's Trump's rhetoric now. And it's no longer for many people noteworthy. Um, I think for a lot of people, it's like, well, how many times can we talk about that? Also, um, uh, you know, how many more stories do we need about Scott Pruitt before he's forced right. to, right? I mean, it's like, 
But the reason this is happening is because the Republican Party is complicit in it, right? Like mm -hmm. they will not hold any, you know, Trump or Pruitt or anybody else accountable. And so, you know, it's, I, but I worry because like, you know, there for a lot of people who aren't ardent partisans, right? the fact that one of the two major political parties is like pretty much A-OK -okay with everything that's going on, I worry that that's evidence to people that it is okay, right? We have mm -hmm. two political parties and, you know, one of them says it's okay or, you know, is, it seems like it's okay with all of this. And so maybe it is. And I think that that's the thing that worries me the most about this stuff getting kind of um, ingrained in our political culture is 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 that Republican complicity. There's no There's no Republican oversight. And by this stuff, you mean, for example, the way he speaks in just such a deeply unpresidential and often offensive way that would have been headline news both under any other president and at the beginning of his presidency. Um, it's, you his, mean, it's his rhetoric. Yeah. It's his policies. Uh, it's the corruption, the rampant corruption, rampant yeah. corruption. And the conflicts of interest. The, the, right. The, I mean, yeah, it's it's almost too much. It's too it's too vast for most people to even wrap their mind around, and then um, and then just the the real um, disdain and contempt for the opposition. And when he is thinking of the political opposition, he's also including the media, uh, and you know the Republican Party is just standing by for every last bit of it, and. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that in a lot of ways like that, I worry about that normalizing it just because I think for a lot of us who, who, who write about this stuff or, are, or people who are very involved in politics and political activism, they tend to forget that most of America isn't as tuned into all of this as they are. You know, so mm -hmm. like the denizens of Twitter are much more uh, engaged in all of this than most other people are. Um, so I think that for other people who aren't as engaged in it on a day-to-day -day basis, the fact that the Republican Party is letting it go, I worry that they, they will view that as, as consent. And they might rightly view it as consent, but that they um, would view it um, as making this kind of like a normal part of our politics now. Now, one thing where, one place where he has gotten a little blowback from Republicans uh, is the family separation thing on the border, right? You, you think not much blowback? Not enough. Yeah. Not, well, well, what is the state of play? I mean, it's a good, good point. I'm not sure where we are on that thing. I mean, yeah, he kind of pretends to try to roll it back or, or whatever. I don't even know what the legal status is. You know, he said, okay, we're going to do something about this. You're right. It's a, Demo you know, yeah, it's a bad thing. It's the Democrats fault. I'm going to try to fix it. Um, and then I don't know where we actually are. It's still happening, basically. Well, so look at this. Okay, so the ACLU and I think maybe some other groups brought a lawsuit seeking an end to the family separation and, you know, for the families that had been separated from each other in order reuniting them. So the judge issues this order, you know, says you have to stop the family separations and within 30 days, these kids have to be reunited with their families. And um, I think, a shorter period of time for younger kids, 14 days, maybe. I can't mm -hmm. remember what the number was. But, you know, this is how he's starting to erode the rule of law. There's a, sorry, there's a, uh, I almost, <laughs> there's a federal court order. No, go ahead, order. You, can, you can say it. This is, <laughs> there's a fucking federal thing. court order. And, um, and, you know, the, the Trump administration is acting like, well, we're not really sure how we're going to reunite these kids. We're not really sure where everybody is. And we're not sure like that we have the capacity at HHS which, by the way, has something like 30,000 employees. It's a huge bureaucracy. You know, so the idea that you cannot deploy a whole bunch of people to reunite kids with their parents is just mind-boggling to me. Mm -hmm. Yet, this is where we are. And then there was another court order um, uh, yesterday or the day before on family detentions, ordering an end to these family detentions. Um, but, you know, the Trump administration is trying to modify that consent decree in, in Flores so that they can detain um, uh, 
families indefinitely. So there's so many different things going on. And I think it's even hard for people like you who are, you know, paying close attention to this stuff. So I think that a lot of it just gets kind of lost to the fact that he acts, he and his administration act like, oh, well, we can't, how are we going to comply with this court order? It's way too complicated, this mess that we made. And, um, it, you know, it's, it's mind boggling that, you know, the federal courts cannot um, force this administration to fix this gigantic humanitarian and moral crisis that it created. Yeah. No, it is uh, his ability to just say stuff that's not true with absolutely no political consequence. I mean, that's another thing that's just been normalized. Mm -hmm. He just says shit. And, and uh, you know, it, it's, um, I mean, this is actually a relatively minor example, at least in the sense that, you know, I mean, when he says, okay, I'm new policy, I'm fixing it, you know, that's relatively sophisticated uh, deception, mm -hmm. you know, because it's like, it gives him a couple of days and people kind of buy it, like maybe he will fix it and then it fades. So I can see America falling for that, but it's just like, he just so often just says blatantly, actually untrue things about things he himself has said within the last couple of days. Mm -hmm. Like I never said this, or I did say that. And, and uh, obviously I'm, I, I am, what I'm doing now is worse than wasting my breath in the sense that I think the more we huff and puff about it, the more that convinces his base that we are implacable enemies and or crazy, which leads to another whole kind of set of, I mean, I'm not going to stop doing it, but I mean, uh, there is this whole other question about what the tactically smart way to play this is in terms of what to get outraged about. I do think we're not sufficiently selective in our outrage. Um, whether we should, you know, the, the whole civility question, is it smart to deny uh, Sarah Sanders a place to eat and, or to harass Mitch McConnell and his wife? I tend to think, no, not tactically smart. But, um, you know, what, I mean, what do you think of this whole set of kind of tactical questions and whether he's created this situation where you just kind of can't, the opposition kind of can't win because if they complain vociferously about anything, it reinforces his narrative. Right. But I think ultimately if, uh, people who care about preserving our democracy don't say anything. Yeah. I mean, you know, you, you can't, you can't do that. Right. No, you have to keep saying things. Right. I, I think sometimes you have to be careful about how you say them and, 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 uh, and, and how sarcastic you are or aren't and so on. But, but, um, and which things you pick, you, 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 you choose to magnify, but no, you can't stop talking about it. Right. And, you know, the civility thing is like, it's such a, you know, I mean. <sighs> you don't have a very pro-civility look on your face right now, Sarah. Well, I think that, the, that, that defining it as civility is just, the, is just not the right way to frame this. Well, question. I agree for probably a different reason than you do. I don't like the whole civility framing of it. But go ahead. Why don't you like the civility framing? Because I don't think it's uncivil to express your political uh, point of view or to petition your government or to petition government officials. No, certainly not. Not um, themselves. Right. And so, um, and I also believe... Um, you know, having covered conservatives for so long and having covered intensely this battle over does the baker have to serve the gay couple, I think it's perfectly within a restaurant's, um, uh, you know, right as a private business owner um, to uh, raise a moral question about um, a public figure um, dining in their restaurant. Um, I think it should be reserved for very unique circumstances. Um, and I think that that unique circumstance in the case of the Red Hen was the fact that this um, restaurant owner did not want to serve someone who stands up and lies to the American people on a roughly daily basis on behalf of an administration that is doing a lot of terrible things to a lot of people. Um, but, um, 
you know, so I guess like to me, like I had no issue with it, but then of course it becomes a thing and it's the thing that's discussed on cable news ad nauseum and on Twitter and everybody's fighting about it. And like, it's just kind of like, um, like, I guess like to me, it was just not a big deal, but of course it becomes a big deal. Um, but well, I it, think- was, it was predictably a big deal on Fox News. That's my <laughs> issue with it. It's just like, and, right. and the reason I don't like the civility framing is like, that, and then people say, well, do we have an obligation to be civil to say, no, that's not my point. You don't have an obligation to be civil to, I don't like this discussed as like some kind of moral question. It's a, to me, it's a tactical question. Uh-huh, uh-huh. You I know, have, yeah, yeah. it's going to show up on Fox News and mm-hmm. only galvanize Trump's base. And you yourself are probably going to get no mileage out of it. And maybe that's wrong. Maybe you will get mileage or whatever. But if that's the case, if it is kind of clearly just on tactical grounds, a bad idea, then I'm done. That, that's, that's, it's like, I, I'm, I'm very, pre- I try to be very pragmatic in that way. And to me, it's just that it's totally predictable how that's going to play out in Trump land. And so unless you're going to get something really big out now, there are people who made the argument and maybe they're right that. Well, just as it galvanizes Trump's base when it's shown on Fox TV, this kind of demonstration galvanizes our base and will help us get out the vote in November. Well, to the extent that's true, I'm willing to reconsider. I'm not convinced uh, that we do wind up winners in this one. But at any rate, that, at any rate that's the way I'd like to see the question kind of debated. Yeah, I guess I'm not sure on a tactical, um, on a tactical level. I think that there is... Um, there is a history there in the Antifa movement and the anti-fascist movement. Um, some of the tactics which have been take, taken up by people who I, who I think perhaps might not consider themselves to be Antifa, but this idea of no platforming mm-hmm. um, people whose um, political views are beyond the pale, basically, or political actions are beyond the pale. And I think it worked with, um, with no platforming uh, members of the alt-right, right? Like Spencer? Yeah. Um, you know, I was, uh, reporting on him in Michigan, the last, um, college visit that he did. And, um, you know, so there were a bunch of alt-right figures in town for like a a conference and, um, and his speech. And this was in the Detroit area, Detroit Lansing area and restaurant owners refused. Um, you know, there was a restaurant that they had rented like a, you know, a private room at the restaurant. The restaurant found out who rented the room, said, no way, canceling the contract. Um, and they got complete backing from the community. There was no blowback yeah. for no platforming, you know, the alt-right. But I think that we still retain in terms of like someone who holds public office or, you know, works for the president, like Sarah Huckabee Sanders. Um, I think that they that, that people generally don't really consider Consider like that. There's sort of like a respect for the office, or you know, respect for Mitch McConnell and Elaine Chao, or something like that, where that sort of thing wouldn't work. But I think, um, but I think it it has a history. I just think that um, even people on the left, perhaps, have while they have no issue whatsoever with no platforming the alt right, um, maybe have an issue with doing that with people in public office. And maybe that's because of the potential precedent for that. Like you're talking about a tactical issue in terms of uh, Mm -hmm. voter energy and all of that. Um, But I think it's also potentially like, okay, so what happens when, um, you know, uh, uh, Kamala Harris is president? (laughs) Is there going to be, you know, some conservative, um, right. restaurant owner who refuses service to her press. Right, there's just the downside of setting precedents like that that could become just a continuously polarizing... Right, but I mean, what I'm saying is like, I think that, you know, I think that Sarah Huckabee Sanders does lie, you know, on a regular basis when she holds her uh, press briefings. Um, well, press and press secretaries so like, in general are not known for their <laughs> relentless veracity. I mean, let's face it, right? I mean... They're, they're, they are spokespeople and, and, and you know, kind of like corporate spokespeople, except a lot worse. Right. Now, she is, I, I agree with you, that she is representing a particularly, uh, you know, dishonest president. And, and, as a, and, it, and that it shows up in the things she says. There, but, uh, but anyway, that's my little asterisk. Uh, yeah. No, uh, I understand. I understand. The, the, uh, 
so there's a related thing. Uh, I mean, we're almost out of time, but there's a related concern, tactical concern. Well, it's not closely related, but it is a tactical concern, which is, is the left moving too far left for practical purposes? So there was this surprise victory by Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez in New York, right? which I found pretty heartening. Yeah. There's kind of two separate issues. There's, uh, you know, she's a, a democratic socialist or, you know, she's more or less, she's a, she was a Bernie Sanders, uh, you know, person. Right. And uh, there's that. And then there's a specific issue that arose because she um, embraced the dissolution of ICE, you know, the, the people who do. Abolish ICE, right. Yeah, abolish ICE. <clears throat> and my, I tend to separate those two things. I don't really think the, the so-called socialist policy I don't think it's even a huge practical problem. I mean, I, I, I think, uh, you know, Ameri- it's not like if you say, I'm going to give you universal health care, people are, oh, no, you're a communist. It's like, yeah, well, that well, sounds okay. Well, some people will be, but yeah, okay. <laughs> yeah, some will be, but I mean, it, 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 there are a lot of people in Trump's base that would love guaranteed health insurance. And, 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 and also, I think separate from that, I think Bernie Sanders is viewed favorably by a number of people who wound up voting for Trump because like Trump, he's not a regular politician. He seems to, he seems to like care about something and he seems to be thinking about the working person and so on and so on. I'm not so concerned about the socialism thing. I do think the abolish ICE, even though it could well be good public policy, I, I, I've heard a case, you know, plausibly made that uh, you could, you could handle the enforcement of this stuff much better with a, with a totally different, Uh, structure. It just seems to me like it makes it a little too easy for Trump to say, these people want to abolish ICE. They're, you know, that they don't care about your safety, et cetera. Yeah. Yeah. Blah, blah, blah. They want to open the borders. Of course, that's not true. Right. Right. But it seems like you're making it easier for him to say that. So what do you think about this whole set of issues about seeming too radical in these various ways? Well, a couple things. One is, you know, so I think uh, Tammy Duckworth and, and another Democrat from the Midwest, I can't remember who it was, uh, were definitely sort of, hold on, you know, she won, um, but that is, you know, not, that would, that sells in the Queens and the Bronx, in Queens and the Bronx, but it doesn't sell in the Midwest. And I think that that's the kind of the wrong way to look at it. I think that you have to realize that for younger people, so how old is she? She's like 28, 30. Um, 28. Yeah. I mean, they're looking at, you know, in many cases, like very sort of dire financial futures. So I think if the Democratic Party doesn't recognize that and recognize that they have to start speaking to those issues pronto instead Mm -hmm. of marginalizing them because of, you know, because of the way that conservatives have made socialism a dirty word in the United States. That's a huge tactical mistake in my view. Um, The abolish ICE stuff, I view that as kind of like the leading edge of what the left really wants to push for. And it's the sort of issue that, yes, Trump is going to seize on it to make Democrats seem like, you know, open borders, you know, gang member hugging, you know, Mm -hmm. leftists. But I think it's the sort of issue that, um, you know, done right, advocacy for it done right, could really educate a lot of people about what ICE really does. I think part of the reason why Mm -hmm. that slogan is not selling is that a lot of people don't even know what ICE is, right? Right. So like if you... um, don't know somebody who's in danger of deportation, say, right? Yeah. Um, you might not know what ICE does, what it's supposed to do, and what it does in actuality, right? It's, it's just another one of those Washington acronyms. So, I mean, I think that, you know, um, conservatives have called for the abolition of federal agencies before, and sure. right, some and, of them now run agencies they've called for the abolition of exactly, exactly. So, um, and I think that they succeeded, um, they succeeded in making the conservative movement of basically anti government movement, um, 
using that kind of rhetoric. Now, I'm not suggesting that the left should become anti-government, but I think that the left is a movement that's anti-government excess, right? And so that's mm -hmm. what the Abolish ICE movement is about. But I think a big part of the reason why it hasn't caught on, I think, is that people have no idea what ICE is. Yeah. Well, as they develop one, I think I'd rather see a slogan like reform it or abolish it or something, you know, and like in the course of calling attention to to its various excesses. Yes. But maybe maybe I'm too uh, too conservative uh, tactically. <laughs> um, the uh, all I know is Trump got pretty gleeful when we started talking about abolishing ice and that worried me. Um, yes, yes, because I think, you know, he definitely he thinks he's going to win by scaring people about um, uh, immigrants and refugees being criminals. Yeah. So, you know, I think he was, you know, rubbing his hands together at the prospect of another talking point for him to use. But I, I, I don't know, like I'm skeptical of that being the measure of of what. Um, what uh, Trump's political opponents should or shouldn't do. Okay, well, thank you for taking the time, uh, especially on 4th of July Eve. Do you have any big Independence Day plans? Uh, Just, uh, you know, cookouts and stuff, the usual. Oh, cool. Well, you're ahead of me. I don't even think I'm going to do anything that interesting. <laughs> um, the, uh, and do you have, uh, you have anything uh, you want to plug in particular? What is your Twitter handle again? It's, is it just it's, Sarah Posner? Right. Uh, and and what, uh, recent articles or articles you're working on you want to talk about? Um, I have a couple things I'm working on um, that I'm not uh, not really in a position to talk about yet. Um, but I did recently um, uh, write a piece for the Nation about um, House uh, one state in particular, South Carolina, is trying to pressure the Trump administration to give them special religious exemptions or give uh, foster care agencies in their state uh, special religious exemptions. There's a foster care agency in South Carolina that wants to only place children with Christian families and is seeking uh, a, a exemption from the Federal Department of Health and Human Services with the, with the stamp of approval Did, from their Does the governor. agency receive federal funding? Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, all foster care placement is done via you know, it's a federal program that then gives money to like the state social services agency, which uh -huh. then uses that federal money to, um, you know, uh, basically retain uh, private foster care placement agencies to place the children that are in the state's care. Okay, well, so people can read that now and then they can uh, keep checking issues of the nation in hopes of seeing your future stuff. Um, right. The nation, the new republic. Yeah. Okay. Well, thank you so much for taking the time. Uh, have a happy uh, 4th of July. Enjoy your cookouts. Thank you. And I'm glad to hear you being a real American about it. <laughs> All right. Thanks, Bob. Okay. Bye-bye.